Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. I am thrilled that there are 17 indigenous people groups here today. I'm absolutely thrilled. And um, I am so humbled by the strength of the commitment that the local community and the scientific community has to the protection of this region. So what I'd like to do is, ooh, not a good start. Give a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to ask these questions. What's the context? What are the main strengths and weaknesses of the management regimes? We heard a lot about management regimes uh, from Tom Crothers yesterday. So I just want to pick up a few things. Then I want to give you an example of how politics has shaped water management in Queensland. I was going to just touch on it very quickly, but my conversations yesterday with quite a few of the people here made me realize that I needed to speak on it a little bit more. Then I asked the question, what do the people in the Cooper want? And what are some of the options open to you? This is not going so well. The other finger. Okay, what's the context? I drew a table for myself just to have an idea of what the policy and legislation has done through these years. And I want to start off in 1989 with the Water Resource Act. And I want to ask you to hold this in your mind for a little while, 1989. Then um, the things in red, which you can't really see, they come out in bold, are where I think there's been a real demonstration of people power. And that's here in the Cooper. I have seen people power elsewhere, but it is alive and well in the Cooper. So 94, you had your protest group. Then you had your scientific workshop that Bob talked about. And then you had, I should correct that, not a womp, it is a wimp. <laughs> okay, WMP, which prohibits irrigation in 2000. Then we had the intergovernmental agreement. And not so long ago, I want to hold this date again, 2011, the, the Wild Rivers Declaration for both the Cooper and Georgina Diamantina. And we also had a WERP, the Water Resources Act, go, a Water Resources Plan in 2011. So a couple of dates that I'd like you to keep in mind. And I'll explain why as we go along. Okay, what else is important about the context? We have this declaration by declaration, this pronouncement by the department. And because the names change so frequently, I'm just going to call it the department. Okay, and you know what I mean, the department in charge of water. 2011, it has in its annual report the statement an intention to develop an alternative management strategy or an alternative management framework for better balance. So it presupposes there is no balance. Okay? That's the presumption. You, ha you haven't got it right in Lake Air Basin. We are going to make it right, right for you. Okay. So then, when I go through the talk, I'd like you to consider some principles of good governance. So I can talk for two or three days on this. I'm just going to say there are two principles that I think are appropriate for us. One is transparency, okay, how decisions get made, what sort of data, what sort of information goes into the decision. All that needs to be transparent to the community. So that's the meaning of transparency. The other one, which is not often talked about, but I believe is part of the rule of law. We want the rule of law and not the rule of man. The rule of law says, for example, natural justice, you should know the charges against you. 
okay, and be given a chance to defend yourself. That's part of the rule of law. Another part of the rule of law says that laws should not change at someone's whim and fancy. There should be a fairly stable legal framework so you know how to plan your affairs. Okay, I'd like to, for you to keep that in mind as well, stability of the legal framework. Then, I, I have heard a little bit about the history and for me, a his, history is a predictor of the uh, present, it tells us about the present, and is a predictor about the future. So I'm told that psychologists and psychoanalysts, you guys may be better at this than I do, they look for patterns of behavior. What was the pattern of behavior in the past that shaped the trends now and kind of can predict the future? So, the second question after we've looked at context are, is what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of present regimes? I won't look at everything. The two present management regimes in Queensland that apply in the Cooper is the water planning regime and the Wild Rivers Act and its declarations. So the strengths, let's start on the strengths. What are the strengths of water planning? The plans are subordinate legislation. We heard this from Tom. So they lapse after 10 years, 10 year cycles, people come back, they review it. The intention of the government now is not to remake water plans, that they can be extended without going through the whole process of consultation. I'm told that this is a proposal of the government. The other strength of water planning is that it allows for participation of the community. Now, I'm sad to say that recent amendments that made community reference panels a mandatory part of the planning process, that provision has been taken away. So that strength, again, has been diluted and it's up to the discretion of the minister. The third strength is that environmental flows and water security objectives are provided in a water planning process. Now, I'd like to take you to the focus. The focus, I believe, of water resource planning is that water is a resource. It looks at take. It allows access and take of water. So we see things, provisions like water use, allocation, and flows. The thought of environmental flows, although they are provided, they usually are not primary focus of plans. Now, you may disagree with me, okay? Wild Rivers Declarations, let look, let's look at the, the, the strengths. Now, this is a statutory instrument. It does not lapse after 10 years. It can go on indeterminately. However, the Wild Rivers Act requires a five-year reporting period and, of course, amendments. Acts can be amended. Amendments can come in. And we see now a proposed amendment to the Wild Rivers declaration for the Cooper, and that was raised by Stuart yesterday. Ostensibly, the amendments are to provide for operational safety and efficiency for petroleum and gas operations. That's the objective of the amendment, stated objective. However, I want to tell you that when I quickly look through it this morning, operational works are now allowed in a flood channel, if considered reasonable. And it is to occur be below or at bed level of the flood channel. For me, that's, that's a big advance, or that's a, that's a very significant uh, provision. And it's, it doesn't sound to me 
that is providing for operational safety of gas and oil operators. All right, so let's keep going. Statutory instrument, Wild Rivers Declaration. This is important. The Wild Rivers Declaration is one of the few pieces of legislation that actually curtail and limit mining and petroleum legislation. Every other piece of legislation, including the Water Act, is usually trumped by petroleum and gas legislation. So hold that in your mind. The other thing is declarations provide for very targeted protection. So you would be more familiar than I am with the declaration here in the Cooper and Georgina Diamantina. You've got high protection areas, you've got specialized floodplain protection areas, all of that very minutely recorded on a map. So it's very detailed. Now the focus of Wild Rivers Declaration, of course, is on the preservation of values, natural ecosystem values, as well as assets. And that takes me into weaknesses. The water planning regime is not able to provide for this detail of protection. Wetlands, we don't see that often mentioned in WRPs or ROPs, okay? There's very limited scope for wider catchment management protection in, a, in water planning. And in water planning, we see examples that have happened where the water plans have either been overridden or amended just after it has been made to provide for plans. And I won't go into details. Maybe Tom will give us more information on this later. And then the, third, the last point regarding relative weaknesses between the two regimes is that mining and petroleum legislation generally trump any other legislation. And in the condomine, in the condomine alluvium, where irrigators were really threatened by CSG mining just last year, very recently, the water, uh, the department was saying to them, we can't really deal with CSG issues in water planning. Okay, other than just to update you on what's going on. Now, Wild Rivers, some of the weaknesses are there was a lack of engagement with the indigenous community in other, commu in other areas. And there is therefore no support from the indigenous community in some areas. Okay, the other weakness which it's perceived to lock up resources, so you can't touch them, okay? But this is a double-edged sword, okay? It is a weakness, there is some locking up, but it also is protection from the locking up. And the third weakness of Wild Rivers is the amount of detail is sometimes hugely daunting. So you've got to be very, very, very familiar with the declaration. I go on to the example of how politics has shaped water management in Queensland. Whoa. Okay. I want to talk about Cubby. This is the myth that the Queensland government was not able to control floodplain flows and that the land court allowed people in. They just willy-nilly expanded water uh, uh, take. What is the reality? More complicated than that. We had the 1989 Water Resources Act. There was a moratorium placed on all licenses in the condomine Ballon from about 1991. And within the 89 Act, there was limited ability to control works on the floodplain, not to take, not to control access to water, but to control works. And then we have a trio of cubby-related cases. 1992, government tried to designate that area. That's how they controlled works. If you designate, you can control the works. If you do not designate, you cannot control the works. In New South Wales, where they took this provision, 
there had been 13 successful designation of floodplain areas. In Queensland, one and only unsuccessful attempt because it went to court. The court said, you haven't got the boundaries right. You didn't re-advertise. You changed the boundaries. That designation is bad, invalid. So government withdrew. 1994, Cubby seeks resource security. Their works were not licensed. They went to court saying, I want a declaration from the court that these works are authorized works. And with authorization, authorization of the works, remember there's a moratorium in place, those, those licenses, those works are going to be secure. However, the court says, uh -uh, you cannot get this declaration. This is a significant win for the department. But we don't hear that, okay? Then in 1993 to 96, this is the most, the, the last is the most significant of the Cubby cases. Cubby seeks further resource security. It's, it's, it's a, uh, they wanted a referable dam, a referable dam, okay? So that the referable dam is something that has a piece of paper, there's a moratorium in place, but it does not pre it does not prevent referable dams. Okay? Went all the way to the full court of the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in Queen was the highest court in Queensland at that time. It was embarrassing for the department. Sorry to say so. Okay, the department was found to have failed to comply with the law and was embarrassed in court. So what were the realities? In 1989, the law did not require the chief executive to consider the environment in any decision he or she took. Not for licensing, not for referable dams, not for nothing. Okay, that was the law. So, little concern. Secondly, I believe that the government and department were embarrassed in court. Each time they went to court, they fumbled. Okay, they fumbled with the ball, and therefore, they're very fearful of litigation. I believe the third point we want to take away from this is that water flows uphill to money. Okay, and why? 1989, just before a significant election, government in power had been there for 30 years. There is a ministerial direction to the department to issue licenses. And the applications that are in and stuck in there from, from 82 to 89, a lot of licenses were given out. How do I know this? It came out in court. Okay? So more recent uh, realities, the Water Act has given a windfall to Cubby because when they had no licenses and sought so hard to get resource security under the water resource plan and the resource operation plans. Cubby now has 94, 655 megalitres of water a year that they can trade. That's a lot of money. I want to say that the earliest licences that were given out in the condomine Ballon were given to graziers who wanted to proof, drought proof their property. 1950s, 1960s, then the 1990s, fast forward, the graziers then wanted all this to stop. But it's too late to stop. Okay? More recent reality about windfall. Right now, water harvesting licenses are 10 years. That's the maximum. New proposal. Okay, so if you had a lease for 10 years, Adam, Okay, three years have gone. When you want to sell the lease, you've got six years left. That's not going to be very high price, is it? No. When you change the water licenses to 100 years, what do you think happens to your license? They go zoom, 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 10, 10 times in price. Okay. All right, what do the people in Cooper want? Very clear. We've got an act for survey. We need to hear other voices before, be, besides Act Force. They are an important voice, but there are many other voices that need to be heard. What are the options? 
I am I have done research and I've got a cup, couple of copies of the report here which looks at co-management sharing responsibility and decision making and accountability between state state has certain strengths people traditional owner groups have certain strengths sharing of that using a formally recognized relationship recognized by policy and recognized by legislation i believe could be one option that this community should consider so i want to say the threats from resource development are there if you look you can't see it very well on this map the Galilee Basin. You know more about this than I do. Okay, major resource. Okay, lessons from the Darling Downs in Queensland. Existing legislation does not adequately protect landholders. Okay, so suggestions. I know that there might be a declaration from this conference. So, a continued support of the Wild Rivers Deck in 2003 opening up the debate so that a formally recognized relationship of management by the people is considered and I think having in mind stability we don't want to rush this by 2023 2023 standalone legislation that can provide an institutional structure for co-management of the LEB. Thank you.